Okay, well, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm, I'm Scott Podolsky and I, I have the pleasure of uh, helping to organize our departmental seminar series. And we're again thrilled this fall to host multiple se seminars devoted to the health of indigenous peoples. And for this, we're grateful for the wisdom and input of our colleague, uh, Dr. Joseph Gahn. Um, I'll get to introduce Professor Gahn himself and he'll have the honor of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Robida. Joseph Gahn is Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine in our department, Professor of Anthropology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge. He's collaborated for over 25 years with American Indian and other indigenous communities to rethink community-based mental health services to harness traditional culture and spirituality for advancing indigenous well-being. He's an enrolled member of the Anani Grovan Tribal Nation of Montana, and among many other roles, is the director of the Harvard University Native American Program. As I'm sure that neither he nor Dr. Robineau will mention it, I'd like to congratulate both Dr. Gan and Dr. Robineau for their recent elections to the National Academy of Medicine. And with that, I'll turn this over to Dr. Gan. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. And it's really my pleasure today to welcome you all to this latest installment of our Indigenous Health and Wellbeing Colloquium series. One of the things I wanted to do um, when I took over uh, the faculty director role for the Harvard University Native American Program, or HUNAP, was to develop a seminar series like this in concert uh, with um, colleagues in the Department uh, of Global Health and Social Medicine in the medical school and uh, with HUNAP sponsorship to bring a broader attention to issues of indigenous health. So this is, uh, you know, the maybe the third installment of this particular series, and I'm really delighted today to welcome our guest. Before I do that, um, HUNAP has collaborated closely uh, with the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog here in the Commonwealth uh, to develop an acknowledgement of land and people. Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Today, we're so fortunate to have with us as a speaker in our series, Dr. Yvette Rubido. Yvette Rubido, MD, MPH, is the director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians, which is sometimes referred to as the United Nations of Indian Country here in the United States. The mission of the NCAI Policy Research Center is to provide tribal leaders with the best available knowledge to make strategically proactive policy decisions in a framework of native wisdom that positively impact the future of native peoples. Her prior work includes research, education, and policy development in the areas of native health and the quality of diabetes care. She served in the Obama administration as a senior advisor to the HHS Secretary for American Indians and Alaska Natives, and as the director of the Indian Health Service. She is currently an adjunct professor at the Department of Health Systems Management and Policy at the Colorado School of Public Health. Dr. Rubido directed training programs to encourage native students to enter health research professions she is a founder of the Native Research Network Incorporated. She has served as the president of the Association of American Indian Physicians. Dr. Rubido received her undergraduate medical and public health degrees here at Harvard. Welcome back, it's good to have you back. Authored several peer reviewed research publications and co-edited the 2001 book, Promises to Keep Public Health Policy for American Indians and Alaska Natives. And as uh, Professor Podolsky also just noted, uh, Dr. Rubido last week was just elected into the National Academy of Medicine. So congratulations for that terrific honor. And Dr. Rubido is gonna talk to us today about the role of research and data in advancing American Indian and Alaska Native health policy. So uh, Dr. Rubido, I turn the floor over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Let me share my slides. All right, well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are today, and thank you so much for attending. Again, I'm Dr. Yvette Rubido. I'm a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe and also descended from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I really wish we could have all been together in person today, uh, but I'm currently in the DC area, which is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples. Thank you to Dr. Gahn, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and the Harvard University Native American Program for the invitation to speak today. I would also like to thank the Lumina Foundation for funding NCAI to encourage American and Alaska Native students to enter research careers. 
So I am the director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians, or NCAI. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about how research and data can help advance American Indian Alaska Native health policy and lead to some of the solutions that we need to the biggest challenges we are facing today in Indian country. All right, well, now that you know a little bit about me and why I'm here, I'm interested in learning more about you. And if uh, I were there in person and there weren't too many of us, I would ask everyone to introduce themselves. However, we are virtual. But I would still love to know who's listening. And I think it's a great opportunity for us all to network since Indian country is small and a lot of us might know each other. So uh, what I'd like to ask Carol to do is to drop a link into the chat to a Padlet. And let's do some virtual introductions. So just click on the link and then you can write your name, year or title and organization under the category that most fits you or you can create a new category. So for example, if you're an undergraduate, click on the plus sign below that category and write your name in the white box that appears. I will delete this Padlet when we're done. So you don't have to worry about it. It's not gonna be used for anything. I just wanted you to have a chance to see who else is here. And I wanted to see who's here and to network a little bit like we're in person. So again, Indian country is small and I'm certain that many of you will see each other again many times in your career. So feel free to enter the information. And again, of course it's optional. So now I'm gonna to try to project the Padlet for those who um, maybe don't see it. Let me uh, find it. Here you go. Great, people are figuring it out. You just press this um, plus sign and then a thing will come up and you can write your name um, and you can add it there. So now let me get that out of the way. Looks like we're starting to see some people. You know, for all the students out there, here's some mentors you might find. For all the professionals out there, here's some collaborators you might find as well. So I can see that People are adding their names, which is great. And um, what you can do is, is scroll down as the um, names get, it, you have to put your cursor over the column to be able to scroll down and see who's here. So it looks like we've got some undergraduates, grad students, academic faculty, and we've got some other people who look like they're um, professionals and um, doing great work and community members, tribal, some people from tribal nations. That's great. All right, we'll just take another minute or two if you'd like to enter your names and who you are, um, that would be great. Again, I wish I was there in person and able to shake your hand and um, able to meet you um, like we all love to gather. All right, so I know there's a lot of you. Oh, Rachel Tracy, hey, how are you? A good friend of mine from IHS. All right, I can see that wherever people are filling it out. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna encourage you to continue filling it out. I'll take one look when I'm done and then I'll delete it after this. So I just hope that this helps you all do um, some good networking um, because whatever career you have, including a research career, um, it's really important to network. And it is so great to see all of you. And so why don't we get started with the presentation? So I'm going to put this down and go back to the slides. Let me project it. All right. I hope people will tell me if you still can't see what I'm doing. All right. Well, first, I'd like to start with sort of how I got interested in policy research is not exactly something that you hear a lot when you're young, when you're considering careers. And actually, this all started with my interest in helping improve the, the health of my people. Um, I received health care as a child in the Indian Health Service, which is the federal agency responsible for providing health care and other services to members and descendants of American Alaska Native federally recognized tribes. 
Indian Health Service was established in 1955 and is now a healthcare system of over 600 hospitals, clinics, and health stations run by the Indian Health Service, tribal nations, and urban Indian health programs. And it was developed as a part of the federal responsibility to tribal nations. So this building is the Suzanne Hospital in Rapid City, South Dakota, where I grew up. And um, I remember I really hated going here. We would wait for hours to see doctors that seemed to be different doctors every time we went. And when I was at Harvard in my freshman year in um, Pearl Butt, as was my dorm in the yard, um, I was really surprised one day my college roommate called her family pediatrician. And uh, I didn't even know what that meant because I'd rarely seen the same doctor twice. I wished I had a family pediatrician back then. Um, but, you know, I had also heard a lot of stories from my relatives receiving poor care or care they didn't understand in the Indian Health Service. And so those stories were all very motivating to me. And at age 16, I decided to become a physician to primarily try to help improve the quality of health care for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Also, that was back in the um, <clears throat> 1970s. And I had really never seen an American Indian or Alaska Native physician at the time. So I thought, oh, well, maybe if we get more American Indian Alaska Native physicians, we can improve the quality of care. Well, I have to say that I had a really great time at Harvard during my undergraduate medical and public health education. It, um, this may sound strange, but it represented sort of a freedom from all the challenges of growing up in South Dakota and it, it was a place where I could just be me. Um, I made lifelong friends, especially at Harvard Medical School. I really love this photo of two of my closest buddies at our 25th reunion, I think this was. Um, you can see we're proud, diverse female doctors in front of, um, well, uh, someone from the past. Um, but, but back then, in the 1980s, when I went to school, some people didn't really understand why I wanted to become a physician and work on an Indian reservation if I was getting my education at Harvard. Um, again, this was a while ago. Um, I actually did have a faculty member tell me, Yvette, you know, you're a really good student. It's such a shame you're wasting this great education just to go work on an Indian reservation. Yeah, he said that. Let that sink in a little bit. Well, it was really d disappointing at the time, but you know, it just made me more determined. I was certain I was on the right path, and so I just kept moving forward. But otherwise, my experiences at Harvard were really, really positive, and that was really one of the few blips on the screen there. All right, so fast forward from college, medical school, and residency. I finally ended up working at the Indian Health Service in the San Carlos Indian Health Service Hospital in Eastern Arizona in the early 1990s. I got to see the challenges of being a physician working in a rural Indian reservation with a tribal nation that was somewhat different than my own. So I had to learn the new culture and all about the tribe. Um, but I, was also, I also realized that they were facing similar health challenges to our people back home. This is the hospital. Sorry, this is actually a picture with actual camera film from back then. Uh, didn't have iPhones. Um, but this is the hospital that I worked in. Uh, at that time in the early 1990s, the hospital was already 30 years old, had limited inpatient beds, had a really small clinic and a small emergency room with only about half the number of physicians we needed to serve the approximately 10,000 people in the San Carlos Apache tribal community. And while the community now has a beautiful new ambulatory care center, um, I really think they probably have already outgrown it. And many other tribal communities continue to be understaffed, have old facilities, and are underfunded. Well, and so that's the issue with the Indian healthcare system. I really loved working at San Carlos, but um, 
I really burned out after three years with the lack of staff and the resources and the long hours and seeing all the disparities. It was very challenging. Um, this is a picture of me in an HMS publication, I think, um, back in 1995. And you see me standing in the emergency room. I was all smiles for this feature article, but I actually was exhausted. Um, being in a situation of working with not enough resources, seeing the disparities every day, having this great Harvard education, but not having the equipment or the resources to fully use it was a really big challenge. And I'm really grateful to all the physicians who work in American and Alaska Native communities for any period of time, but especially those that work for their entire careers really deserve a lot of praise and thanks. Well, after this, I worked at the Gila River Indian Communities Hospital just when the tribal nation took over the management of the IHS facility in the mid 1990s. And it was so great to see that. It was sort of like a, a burst of hope. At the time, I really felt that self-governance was a chance for tribal communities to take ownership of their healthcare system or clinic and make sure that the healthcare met the community needs, even if the funding that they received from the Indian Health Service was not enough. And there were some tribal nations that had their own revenues that they could help um, use to help improve their health care. And they had new flexibility with self-governance and tribal management where they could move money around in different categories to help better serve their communities. So I was really very excited about all of the possibilities for um, tribal self-governance. But also at that time, in the 1990s, the Gila River, I was internal medicine and you know, almost every patient I saw had diabetes. And I was actually surprised to see a patient of any age without diabetes. And the mortality or death rates at that time for diabetes were rising for American Indians and Alaska Natives. This slide has a graph from the Indian Health Service. It's data from the 1970s to the 1990s. The black line at the bottom are the death rates each year um, for US all races. The gray line is American Indian and Alaska Native mortality rates. And the light gray line above it is the rate that's adjusted for the underreporting of American Indian and Alaska Native race on death certificates, which is really a thing. It's really common. Um, and so a lot of the data that we see for American Indian and Alaska Natives is likely to an underestimate of the true impact. And so at that time, the mortality or death rates related to diabetes were increasing much more than for other groups. And it was sort of a really dire situation. So I have this information in my mind about the tribal management of healthcare facilities as a possible solution and the rising epidemic of diabetes in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Um, and then next, I was really fortunate to be accepted to do a fellowship at Harvard Medical School in Minority Health Policy. And I also got my master's in public health. Um, I'm really grateful for that fellowship and the mentorship of Dr. and HMS Professor Joan Reed. I am forever grateful for this fellowship year, which allowed for reflection, learning, some rest, and then opened up all the possibilities of what I could do moving forward to try to help improve healthcare for American Indians and Alaska Natives. But the outcome of the fellowship was a huge surprise. I surprisingly decided to become a researcher and transition to an academic career, which I had never thought of before. Um, but in my fellowship, I learned about the importance of data in informing policy change and health policy change was desperately needed for American and Alaska Native healthcare. So I learned from this framework that um, I have adapted in this slide that's from Professor Kingdom's framework about how, what things are required to enact public policy. And this framework was introduced to me by Dr. Robert Blandon in the public health school. And it, it's basically about what are the three things that are necessary to enact public policy? So first you need data on the problem. We don't always have that for American Indians and Alaska Natives, but even if you have that data, it's not necessary, but not sufficient. You also need data on the solutions and policies or best practices to address the problem. And hopefully those solutions are evidence-based. But even that is not often not enough. 
And that's what frustrates a lot of people. They do research and then they never see anything change. It's like, what happened? But Kingan says you also need the political players to take action, to have a chance for policy change to happen. And that's usually what's the missing piece. But for American Indians, Alaska Native, data on the problem and data on the solutions is often um, missing as well. So in my fellowship, I suddenly had a way to think about how we could get policy change for improving healthcare for American Indians, Alaska Natives. And the data and research was a fundamental part of it to help identify problems and help identify solutions. But I also noticed from being at Harvard that it seemed that the people who had the research and the data also had all the funding and the resources. So getting more data to show the issues and solutions for American and Alaska Native healthcare seemed like an urgent mission after what I had seen working in IHS and now seeing this type of a framework. We could just get more research and data to show the need and to get the political players to get us more resources maybe we could make some progress. So I have to say, I cannot tell you how surprised I was that I ended up choosing a career in research. I'm the one who actually used to brag that I must've been the only doctor to make it through undergrad medical school and residency without doing a day of research. So I guess this is an important career point. What you think you're going to do now for your career is perfectly fine, but just recognize it might not be what you do in five, 10 or 20 years from now. And that's totally okay. People change what they do in their careers all the time. All right, so I wonder if anybody knows where this is. I know you can't really respond, um, but I call this my spot. So <laughs> this is on the steps of Widener Library in Harvard Yard. And as an undergraduate, I used to sit here sometimes in the afternoon after classes and look out into that space, the beautiful space. And I would think about the impact that I might have in the future based on what I was learning. And you know, when you're at Harvard, a lot is expected of you. So this was the peaceful place that I called my thinking space. I think I never thought about research and data there, to tell you the truth. But nonetheless, it was a really great place to think about the future and also to eat ice cream. That was a big thing in the 1980s. Some of you know about Harold's ice cream. I was very disappointed to go back recently and see they don't exist anymore. But anyway, I digress. All right. So now I would like to invite you into my thinking space and ask you to think about what critical research do we need now to help enact policies to improve healthcare for American Indians, Alaska Natives? What do you think is the top most priority for a research study or data gathering? Now I'd like you to think about that for a minute. Then I'm gonna ask Carol to put another link in the chat that you can click on. This will take you to a Jamboard in the, in, from the chat. It's kind of like a whiteboard. But what I'd like you to do is click on the menu on the left near the post-it icon, the little square one, and a thing will open up. And you can write down your ideas for the most critical research or data that we need right now to improve healthcare for American Indians, Alaska Natives. So this is just a brainstorming exercise. This is, you know, no wrong answers. Um, but I'm really interested to see what you're all thinking. So go ahead and start writing on the Jamboard. Click on that link and go to it. Um, and the post-it icon is on the left near the little post-it that I put there. Start writing. Um, and we'll take a few minutes to brainstorm on this. Now, if you're an organizer, you might see that, um, oh, too many people viewing. So let me post it because we'll, um, what we'll do is have, we'll watch some of the people who are on it. Hold on, let me find it. Maybe I didn't pay enough for more people, but you can see people are now starting to um, put post-its down. So whoever's on there, feel free. Go ahead and write some ideas that you have about research. If there's other people 
um, go ahead and write your ideas in the chat. Maybe someone else can, who has access to the Jamboard can write those in as well. Uh, so these are the things you think you, we need critically in research and data to help improve American and Alaska Native health. And these are just your ideas. These are, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to use this for anything. I'm going to delete it after I read it after we're over. It's just an example for us. If we were in person, I would be asking you these questions as well. So um, looks like we've got climate change, better cancer registry data, um, health outcomes, impact of health resources, community-driven strength-based research about health benefits of cultural practices, how to heal from trauma, alcohol research, elder-centered methods, um, research to um, make healthy life choices, timely public health data, identifying and addressing the impact of intergenerational trauma, health research with women and infants. These are all great ideas. I apologize, I didn't realize there was a um, limit on the Jamboard, but hopefully you can see these and I'm seeing people are putting ideas about research in the chat. Um, uh, let's see, surveillance data on overdoses, mental health, dealing with emotions. See, you all are researchers. You all have those research questions which is really important. Um, research starts with a question. What's the most important research that needs to be done now? And in this case, to influence American and Alaska Native health policy. Again, if you're an organizer, try to group some of them. You might, um, oh, I see it only allowed about 20 people. I think I'm gonna have to pay more to put more people on the Jamboard. So this was a good lesson. Anyway, um, I really appreciate all the oh, information on toxins at home, um, issues around long haul COVID for indigenous people, pediatric research, decolonized research methods. Okay, these are postpartum mental health. These are really good. Um, I can see that the chat is also blowing up with some really good ideas that are uh, ACEs and their impact on parenting. Pipeline programs for Native Americans to become researchers. Zoonotic infections, that's interesting. Indigenous models to inform how we shape and how we conduct research, it's really important. Um, demographics, making sure they're correct. Stopping the undercount, yeah, that's huge. We're working on that. Um, ways to remedy racial misclassification in data. Okay, great. Well, I, I encourage you to continue putting your ideas on this. And it's really just kind of a networking thing. What are we interested in in this group that's here today? All of these areas, if we were to do research or find better data for them and to look for evidence-based solutions um, or best practices to use to try to address them, then that's when the political players, um, all the Indian country advocates, um, senators, congressmen can take the data and research that um, is, is found for these issues and make the argument for more funding. And so again, there's no wrong answers here, but obviously you can see in the chat and you can see on the Jamboard, um, there's just a lot of work to do related to research and data to inform policy. All right, you can keep working on that if you'd like. I'm going to go back to the slides. I believe this is where I was. So again, I once had a mentor explain to me that when you're in research, you often come up with a lot of good ideas. And he recommended that I have a little notebook with me at all times. So if I'm sitting outside enjoying the view or taking a walk or um, you know, doing something, even cleaning the house, um, I might come up with a great research idea. And that mentor told me, make sure you write it down because you never know, you might want to work on that in the future. And because you thought about it on a walk, you might forget it. So these are just some good tips about thinking about um, what we're going to do to help improve American and Alaska Native healthcare. You can see there's a huge amount of um, need to get more research and data on both defining these problems, but also what are the solutions for them. So again, back to the um, adapted framework. Um, and so now you can take what we saw in on the Jamboard and in the chat 
and figure out which ones are data that help define the problem, which ones are data on the solutions or the policies, and are there any advocates that work in that area in Congress or the administration or in tribal advocates that can help move those things forward. And that was my bias about research in the past. I used to think researchers just did studies and published the papers and that was the end of it. But policy research is to do the research to help inform the solutions that um, can help enact policy. And so I think it makes it more relevant because I know a lot of students think research isn't as interesting as being a doctor in a community. And we do need more doctors and nurses and other health professionals in tribal communities. But if that's not your cup of tea and you like research, there's plenty to do in this area. And we urgently need people to help get that data so that we can act the, enact the best policies. Um, so um, and even if you don't see it right now, maybe someday in the future, you'll be working in data. A lot of data people in IHS actually when I uh, worked there. Or you can be, the, why don't you become the political player? You know, run for Congress, uh, you know, um, become a lawyer and work on the Hill and help get these, help take this data to Congress to help enact change. There's a lot to do and we have, need all your help and it's gonna take all of us to keep improving healthcare for American Indians and Alaska Natives in a lot of different roles. And you really literally could do any of these things. I'm speaking mostly to the students, but maybe others thinking of a career change and it will be helpful. And the best part about all of this, there's so much to do. You just pick something and then move forward. You don't have to do it all. Well, so out of all these possibilities, what did I end up choosing to do my research on? Well, as you know, there's a lot. <laughs> well, but a really key thing, I first had to learn how to be a researcher since remember I bragged about not doing any research in my education. So actually after the fellowship, I did another fellowship and then a two year native investigator training program with the University of Colorado and the University of Washington. And I'm so grateful to Dr. Spiro Manson and Dr. Deidre Buckwald for being my lifelong mentors. And they really taught me how to do research, really high quality research while still keeping true to who I was and true to the goals that I had. And I'm, I'm really grateful for their mentorship, um, even to this day, like even like they, they're just so wonderful and helpful to me. And that's what mentors can do uh, to help you along the way. So um, what I end up doing as a researcher, what was my focus area when I was in academics um, at University of Arizona? Well, I was at the University of Arizona as faculty in the medicine and public health schools and uh, for about 11 years. And I focused on efforts to improve the quality of healthcare for American Indians and Alaska Natives, especially in the area of diabetes. You might wonder, how did you pick that? Well, again, it was my experience as a doctor in the Indian Health Service, and especially at Gila River, but, but it also happened through networking. And so that's a big lesson for today. Um, you really have to put your interests out there and meet people who can help and partner with you because um, what I learned in my research training, research is a team sport. You cannot do it alone. It's a big mistake a lot of people make is I'm gonna do this research and I'm gonna to try to do it and whatever, but you have to have research collaborators. You need all the support staff. It, you really have to try to find a team to help you with this research. If you're gonna do um, you know, research in an academic setting or research in an organization. So I wanna tell you about my networking experience. I was at a conference and Dr. Reed taught us that when you go to a conference, it's not just to listen to the lectures, you got to network. So thank you, Dr. Reed, for that education. But so I was at a conference in exhibit hall networking, and I saw an old friend who was also an American Indian physician. We were talking about what we were doing, and I told him about my new ideas about wanting to become a researcher. And I was interested in the area of diabetes. And actually, there was someone in the exhibit right next to us that he knew that he introduced me to. And it turned out it was a key connection for me to do more diabetes related work, um, both public health, health education, and eventually um, research and evaluation. So you just never know. So I want you all to network. I encourage you, especially again, since research is a team sport, you really do need to work with others um, to help 
figure out the ways to advance the ideas that you have and to help improve the skills and you can't do it alone. Um, and so the collaborators and mentors and colleagues that you find, sometimes it is hard to find that when you're interested in American and Alaska Native research, because there's not that many people doing this research. But even if there's nobody at your institution doing this research, you can work with other people and gain those skills that you need. So at some point, um, you can become an independent researcher as well. Um, and if you notice, when you look at research articles, there's always a several authors, not just one. Um, I remember one student told me she was insisting on um, publishing a paper with just her as the author. And I was like, well, no, research, you know, it's a collaboration. You have to put the other authors that helped um, contribute as well. So if you're interested in doing research, make sure you find your team. And now I wanna give an example of how um, data and research can be used for policy change. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna talk about some work that I was involved in, but it wasn't just me, it was the whole team of people working on it. Um, and I'm really grateful to have had a role in that. You know, I wasn't the lead of it, but I was the, um, uh, had various roles in it. And I'm just so proud of the large team of people who were involved in this effort. I don't know if you've heard of the Special Diabetes Program for Indians. It's my very favorite thing to work on during my academic career. Um, there's a lot of great people that have contributed to the success of this program and have been important in its evaluation and showing data that it was successful. So I'm going to focus on this because it is a great example of how data and research can inform policy and lead to policies being enacted that can make a huge difference. So in 1997, the Balanced Budget Act of, uh, was passed, which meant there was extra dollars in Congress to spend on things. And there was an opportunity for new funding to address the problem, the growing problem of diabetes in American Indian and Alaska Natives, um, given the data that people were aware of at the time. Um, so the data was clear. And there were also was new research that showed it was possible to, um, prevent the complications of diabetes with good blood glucose control. And that was the first time we really had good quality randomized controlled trials that showed that surprisingly. And so it turns out we had the data on the problem. We had the data on the potential solutions. And then like Kingdon said, the political players were finally ready to act because they had this balanced budget act and they needed to spend some extra funds. And so all the things in the kingdom framework were really in place for the special diabetes program for India. It's a rare time when that happens. Um, it was people like Newt Gingrich. It was uh, other uh, people in Congress who had an interest in diabetes, Congressman Nethercutt, um, Senator Pete Domenici. Um, they're all people who may not normally hang out together, but they have this common interest about diabetes. And so they were in place they understood that, that American Indians, Alaska Natives needed help in this area, and so they appropriated funds. Now, it started out as $30 million a year, and then after a few years, it went up to $150 million a year since 2004. And the purpose of all this funding was for the Indian Health Service to administer a program that would give grants to the Indian Health Service, to tribal and urban Indian health programs to implement activities to both prevent and treat diabetes in American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, the projects, the cool thing about it is the projects were community directed from the start and there was a tribal leaders diabetes committee that advised and oversaw the activities and they actually developed the funding formula for all tribal nations to benefit from this based on data, which was great. I was on the technical advisor at the time for the tribal leaders diabetes diabetes committee. And it was so great to see the tribal leaders at first saying, no, our community needs more money. No, our community needs more money. And then finally getting to the place that they're like, well, let's figure out a formula that benefits everybody. And so it was so great to watch that sort of diplomacy that happened on this project and it benefited the project in the end. The initiative was evaluated from the beginning and the results are available in several reports to Congress. And Congress has refunded 
this program based on the great evaluation data that the Indian Health Service has been able to give Congress to show it's worthy of being refunded. Again, this is due to a lot of people, the Indian Health Service, their diabetes program, tribal urban Indian health program staff, and many, many other people. So you can actually read the um, 20, the latest uh, report to Congress was in 2020. You can actually read that. You can get that on the Indian Health Service website. And um, this report represents over 20 years of this initiative and an over $3 billion investment in diabetes treatment and prevention for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Uh, and a lot of our hard work by a lot of people in tribal communities. But the data shows that the impact has been significant. And again, the data has helped Congress keep funding this initiative over the years. So for example, the 2020 report to Congress confirms that the outcomes continue to be amazing through this IHS's evaluation of the program. And there's ample evidence that because of these resources, IHS and tribal programs have been able to increase, for example, diabetes services that have helped improve care. You can see in 1997 versus 2019 in this graph. Um, this chart also shows um, that um, these differences can make, that this improved access to care um, can make a big difference in outcomes. And just briefly, you know, the, over the, the period of the SDPI, IHS has been able to demonstrate that the average blood glucose or blood sugar control in patients with diabetes has improved over time. It has decreased by 10% during the time of SDPI from 1998 to 2019 as measured by their annual diabetes care and outcomes audit in the Indian healthcare system. They have also seen um, hospitalizations decrease by 84% during this time for uncontrolled diabetes, um, which is amazing since 2000. This is the biggest outcome you may all have seen. This is data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's new cases of kidney failure each year from 1996 to 2013 for different racial and ethnic groups. The dark blue line is American Indians and Alaska Natives. And you can see that the incidence or the new cases per year has dropped faster over that time period in American Indians and Alaska Natives than the other groups and has decreased by 54%, which is huge. Um, and um, the thing about that is it means that less people are going on dialysis, which is a great outcome. And the difference compared to other groups means it's not just a secular or existing trend. And actually every nephrologist, even some Harvard nephrologists that I talk to say we should attribute this difference to the special diabetes program for Indians, since that's what other groups don't have that likely made a difference. Um, but you can see that it took $3 billion over 20 years of effort to get this kind of an outcome. And it shows sort of the magnitude of effort it takes to get this kind of outcome for a health issue, such as diabetes for our population. So much more work needs to be done on all the other issues that we're facing, you know, there's other issues as you saw in what people talked about that could benefit from this kind of funding um, resources um, to address them. One of the best outcomes so far is, I hope you've seen the great news that the diabetes prevalence is now decreasing for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, and has it decreased 15.4% since 2013. And this is the outcome that I think we've all hoped for. And this is uh, the other great news is that diabetes death rates or mortality is now decreasing in American Indians and Alaska Natives. And the graph shows it's decreased by 37% over the same time period as the SDPI. So remember, the graph I showed you was over here in the early 1990s, and it was going up. Then around 2000, the mortality rate started to go down. Um, and SDPI likely had a big um, uh, big input into that. And all the great outcomes that you see are associated with reduced medical costs, like hundreds of millions of dollars saved. 
and there's data on that as well, which helps the underfunded Indian healthcare system pay for other things. So this program has, that was developed based on the data and policy that was enacted and then collected data to continue to help the political players continue the money. Um, is it, I think it's one of the best examples of how policy research can really help make a difference. I also wanna tell you about the Special Diabetes Program for Indians demonstration products. This is the one where I had more of a significant role. In 2004, Congress said, well, you know, they, we need to have you do um, something more, I guess, researchy or get more data on the effectiveness of the SDPI. So they gave $27 million a year to translate the latest research on diabetes and cardiovascular disease prevention um, to the SDPI, to the Indian Health Service. And so there was a competitive grant process and 66 grantees got funded um, to do this work, either diabetes prevention or prevention of heart disease. The thing about these projects is they were collaborative, they were team-based, they implemented culturally appropriate strategies, they had community activities, um, and there was an intensive evaluation. Um, and the most important thing about this was they were in partnership with the local communities. And because they had an intensive evaluation, we now see what the lessons learned were and the outcomes. And I was really fortunate to be involved in this as the co-director of the coordinating center. Now, I remember when the, the, the grantees talked about the evaluation, we actually had two meetings and they were presented with all the options for the evaluation that we could have. And in the end, they decided they did not wanna have a randomized trial. They did not wanna have a controlled group. They just wanted to have an evaluation over time. And, some researchers might be like, well, you can't say anything. It's not a randomized controlled trial, but this is what we can say about this project. And it has shown that it is possible to translate the research into real world communities. And so I'm really proud of the grantees in this program. Um, they did a lot of really creative and innovative things in these commu tribal communities as they implemented the, the core elements of the program and then adapted them to the local culture and circumstances. So you can see in the pictures, um, there's they had diabetes education classes. They adapted the diabetes prevention program, the NIH study curriculum. Um, some used talking circles to teach that curriculum. They had cooking classes where they learned how to make native food more healthy, like fried bread and things that, you know, we need to eat less of or make more healthy as best we can. Um, you know, in places, gardening, getting people to garden more. So they have more fruits and vegetables. Um, in um, one of the communities, they had to do box gardens because of the, the ground wasn't able to do gardening. Testing for risk factors regularly, culturally appropriate incentives, celebrating people finishing the curriculum, and all of these things. I'm really proud of the grantees in this program. They, they, um, they worked hard to work with the um, participants to improve their health, and they also worked hard to participate in the evaluation of the program. And uh, these grantees were able to show that you can prevent diabetes when you translate research into real world communities, that it's possible to do that. Um, and this graph is sort of a superimposed um, combination of the original NIH diabetes prevention program results, superimposing the results of the SDPI diabetes prevention program. And it shows that the rate of new cases of diabetes or the incidence over six years um, for um, the SDPI diabetes prevention program roughly um, was similar um, in a reduction uh, to the NIH diabetes prevention program. So the top line on the graph over time, that top line, uh, orange line, was the control arm of the original NIH DPP study. And the lowest line is the white line, is the reduction in new cases of diabetes during the same time period in the um, intervention arm of the original NIH DPP study, which found that a 16-week diabetes prevention curriculum reduced the incidence of new cases of diabetes by this degree. Um, the blue line superimposed on this graph is the SDP, and we recognize it's not a perfect comparison, but this is the SDPI diabetes prevention program results, which in rough, it's a rough comparison, but it shows similar reductions in new cases of diabetes from the expected rate at the top line over the time over time. So um, in the evaluation of these demonstration products, we had to get creative, but it enabled us to show that it is possible to prevent diabetes in partnership with tribal communities 
and that the diabetes prevention program research really could be translated into 66 diverse American and Alaska Native communities. And that's also really great news. Well, my um, research career got interrupted a little bit um, just as we were finishing these demonstration products projects, I surprisingly got nominated and confirmed to be the director of the Indian Health Service during the Obama administration. And I thought, oh, no, my research plans are on hold. Um, but actually, as I think back, some of the best parts of the job were being able to take data to the administration and Congress to help address issues such as the funding need. And I had to testify a lot. But one of the most impactful things that I remember happening was Representative Tom Cole from Oklahoma asked me during a budget hearing, to get him data on the disparity in funding for the Indian Health Service so that he could argue for more funding for the Indian Health Service with his congressional colleagues. It was a chance to use data to get more resources. Unfortunately, there's data people in the Indian Health Service who work on data. And so um, they had this um, uh, comparison of per person or per capita expenditures uh, for the Indian Health Service here on the right medical and other with other federal health care systems such as Medicare, national health care spending, veterans care, Medicaid, and federal disparity benchmark, which is an IHS thing. You can see that the Indian Health Service spending per user is far below that of other federal health care sources. And so uh, Representative Cole took that to his colleagues and we got a big increase in the budget that year. And it reminded me of how helpful it is to not only have data and information, but to visualize it in a way that's easy to see the point that you're trying to make. And it's really clear that the lack of adequate resources is a huge barrier to fully meeting the mission of the Indian Health Service. So even after we've achieved a billion, we achieved a billion dollar increase during the Obama administration, there still was so much more to do and still a lot of disparities in funding that um, that occurred today. And actually, tribes have calculated that instead of like the six or seven billion dollars that the Indian Health Service has now, IHS really needs 30 to 40 billion dollars to adequately meet the need. So that's why all the new funding during COVID-19 for infrastructure and for healthcare and for health professionals is so important for making improvements in Indian healthcare. So certainly more progress is needed. But this is just an example of how having data and visualizing it in a simple way can make an important policy point. And now just quickly, I wanna tell you a little bit about what I do now. I work at the National Congress of American Indians, which is the oldest, largest, and most representative national organization serving the broad interests of tribal nations. And it works to protect and defend tribal sovereignty. Again, I direct the Policy Research Center and our mission is essentially to get the research and data that tribal nations need to make strategic and proactive policy decisions for their communities. Um, NCAI generally um, you know, doesn't work on health issues. And so I look at this job as working more on the determinants of health, all the other things in tribal communities that can uh, impact the health of those communities. Uh, this is a picture of our current team members. Uh, there's me and Gwen Evans, Lomi Ezva, who's Hopi, and Sierra Watt, who's um, Pechanga. All right. So we do our work right now in three areas, research, strategy, and sovereignty. And I'll briefly tell you about those, and then we'll have time for questions. Research is making sure tribes have research and data on their priority issues, their priority issues. Um, I don't have my own portfolio of interest at NCAI because it's all for the tribal nations. Strategy, helping tribal nations use data in a strategic forward focused manner and then sovereignty, enabling those tribal nations to exert more effective sovereignty over data and research like their research oversight or their um, tribal consultations that might impact their sovereignty. We uh, like to frame our work in terms of the, um, the um, value it provides for our customers as well. But there's a lot of different things you can do with data and research. And this diagram shows a lot of the different kinds of work we do, not the topics, but the way we do that. So we do do some primary data collection. Uh, we also do secondary analysis of existing data. 
Um, but we do a lot of highlighting existing data and translating that data, often with data visualization techniques to help the data be used more effectively for policy work. We also work on tribal research oversight and governance of research. So there really are a lot of ways to work with research and data um, when you're working with tribal nations and American and Alaska Native communities. So in the research area, we um, provide research on priority issues for tribes. Um, some of that includes, um, we're tracking trends in COVID-19 publicly available data. We conducted a landscape analysis of K through 12. Native education, that's really um, all of a sudden had a, we did this in 2008 and now 18 and now some, everybody's interested in it. We're talking about, you know, civics education and mascots and things like that. And then we also translate or visualize data or explain new regulations on research oversight. Um, and a lot of times we're serving as a translator. For strategy, we do have a annual tribal leader scholar forum that we have in our NCAI mid-year conference. And the purpose is to provide space or a forum for researchers to be present and discuss their findings with tribal leaders. In terms of sovereignty, we host trainings on our on um, tribal academic research partnerships and how to strengthen them and make them more effective. A lot of times tribal academic research partnerships go wrong. Um, and so we have this new training, the uh, Holding Space a Guide for Partners in Tribal Research. There's a discussion guide and tribal research futures game. And um, we were doing it in person, uh, but with COVID, our last training was the picture on the slide that was in Minnesota in March. Minneapolis with University of Minnesota. And then we ended up developing a virtual version, version of this training. We held our first virtual training actually with physicians at MGH, at Massachusetts General Hospital who work in rural health in April. And we've conducted two other virtual trainings this year. So if we can get academic partners to work respectfully with tribal nations on research, respecting their sovereignty and all of their rights, we and making sure that the research uh, we can be sure that the research will both protect and benefit the community, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area as well. One other quick thing, uh, we work on the tribal consultations that have to do with researcher data. We've been working a lot on the 2020 census and the problems it has with accuracy due to the privacy protections. And um, I think I'm just now starting to miss um, the second day of the National Institutes of Health Tribal Advisory Committee, uh, where it's involved in tribal consultations in research and data. COVID-19 has made us do a lot of things differently. We ended up for our conferences developing a virtual exhibit, but if you ever see us in the future at conferences, we will likely have a table where you can get um, things in paper versions of documents, which some people still like. All right, this is our website where you can find our publications, webinars, other information. We're on Twitter. I encourage you to follow us. And we have a research update if you'd like to be on our listserv. Email research at ncai.org to sign up for that. One last slide, and then we'll get to the questions. So finally, um, I wanted to say that I recently got, went back to Harvard for a meeting. And I purposely went and sat in my thinking place, again, on the steps of Widener Library. You can see my sad, pitiful boomer selfie skills. I don't even know where to look when I'm taking a selfie. Um, but again, um, I used to sit there and think about what I would do in the future. And actually, I can say for sure, I never thought that in that place that I would be a researcher. Or I would be working on policy research since um, I didn't really understand what it was. So I hope that this presentation has helped understand that research and data really can inform policy changes that are so desperately needed for our communities to help improve their health and wellness. So as you, for the students, as you think about your career goals, just go with what feels right right now and knowing that it may change, um, the change for me, but just keep in mind um, the consistent impact that you wanna have. And if it, if it involves research to inform policy, as you can see today, even from your own ideas, that we generated on the Jamboard, there's, there's plenty to do. And anything you can you do can have an impact for Native communities, and it's dearly needed. Our people are depending on us to help them get the health care that they need and they deserve. So thank you again for the invitation to speak today. Here's my contact information, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. 
And also I'm gonna ask um, uh, Carol to put the link to the evaluation in the chat. I uh, really appreciate feedback for future lectures. Thank you and back to Dr. Gan. Wonderful, Dr. Rubido, thank you so much for that inspired and motivating presentation. I love your presentation style, which is so accessible and, and uh, smooth. Um, so um, we really appreciate that. Folks, I'm gonna ask you to enter the Q&A function with your questions or comments for Dr. Rubido. And I'll give you a minute to do that while I ask a question just to kick us off, but um, please uh, enter those in there. And I will then, um, once uh, uh, we have a moment for you to do that, I'll go ahead and forward some of those along to hear uh, Dr. Rubido's responses. Um, you know, it's a, a pretty wide distance from on the ground health concerns of people on our reservation settings that then percolate or become uh, noticeable to tribal council members. And then, of course, from, you know, a local reservation government all the way to the federal government, there's consultation processes and so on, but it's a lot of distance. And obviously, NCAI and the Policy Research Center play an important role in helping to bridge that. But, you know, the tribal epidemiological centers also are responsible in each of the areas that the IHS operates in to try to provide local data or regional data, at least, back to tribal leaders. I just wonder if you could tell us a little more about the tribal epicenters and what you think their role might be in this entire process of generating data and informing policy. I'd love to tell you more about them. I think they play an extremely important role in Indian country to make sure that tribal nations have the data that they need. And their, um, their work is really focused, as you say, on the local and the regional level. So at the NCAI Policy Research Center, we try to make sure we're just focusing on national things and we don't wanna get in the way of the tribal epidemiology centers because they're the experts on working with tribal nations on local data. They were really critical during the COVID-19 pandemic to help, but you know, remember in the beginning, everybody was complaining, there's no data, we don't know what's going on. The tribal epidemiology centers all really got in there and tried to find the data that they could and use their epidemiology skills to be able to display it. And, you know, um, I really think there's some fantastic work that's gone on in the tribal epidemiology centers around sort of making sure that tribes get that local data. They work with, um, local tribes and teaching them how to like get data locally, how to set up data systems, how to interpret the data that they have. Um, so I'm really uh, grateful for the work that they do. I've collaborated on them a little bit um, with some, some things uh, along the way here. And um, I'm just very grateful for the work that they do. They're doing amazing work. And, and you know, for students thinking about you want to be close to home, you know, these tribal epidemiology, and you want to do research, these tribal epidemiology centers are just great opportunities. Terrific. Thank you for that. And I noticed um, in introducing you, of course, your important role in helping to found the Native Research Network. I don't think uh, enough people know about the Native Research Network. Could you tell us a little more about what the origin of that organization is and how, what it contributes today? Oh, I would love to. Um, well, back in the... Um, late 1990s, there were two groups of American and Alaska Native researchers from various disciplines who happened to get invited to two separate meetings. I was in one of them and that was, um, we were invited to advise the army on their research initiatives for um, minority groups. So we were, we were a part of a bunch of groups that were invited, but there were about 12 American and Alaska Native researchers there were like, oh, you know, even back then it was very rare to see an American and Alaska Native researcher. Similar thing happened in a group that was invited to um, a conference dealing with cancer um, disparities. And sort of simultaneously at the same time, both groups were like, there's so few of us, but we want to help encourage future generations. We need to get together more. We need to find a way to network and to collaborate. And so after some time, we st um, started a listserv. Um, which still is in existence today. I'm not sure who, who's moderating it now. I know I used to do it way back in the day, but um, it's a great opportunity. I uh, forward announcements there all the time. Um, it's a great opportunity to be a part of the Native Research Network to, you know, uh, meet other students and 
and professionals who work in research and to network and collaborate. I think I've had several collaborations with people in that network. There's also with the American Public Health Association, which is happening right now, I think, um, the American and Latin Native, Native Hawaiian Caucus. It's an interest group with the American Public Health Association. It's a lot of the same people. Um, it's just a slight different focus, but um, those are great resources for people to network, not just if you're a student, but if you're working in research and you're lonely and there's no one at your institution and you're looking for collaborators, the Native Research Network and the American and Latin Native, Native Hawaiian Public Health Caucus are great places to go. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from an audience member. What are your thoughts on best practices versus culturally informed practice in healthcare? Absolutely. I think that both of those things are important, but they, um, you know, best practices is like this general term of um, things that are found either through practice or through evidence that work. Um, for example, the Indian Health Service Diabetes Program has a list of best practices that they use and they ask the grantees to implement when they get their funding for the SDPI. But culturally informed practices are just as important, if not more important, because when we think about tribal communities, each community is unique and different. So it's not like you can have just a one size fits all solution to the problems in our communities. And so that's why having culturally informed practices that relate to the actual culture of the people being served, they have a much better chance, I believe, of being effective. Um, if they're developed locally, if they are um, have the culture in mind. And so I think one of the greatest lessons that I had was, um, you know, I'm an American Indian physician grew up in South Dakota, when I went to work on the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation, the tribe had different cultural practices, had different beliefs, different language. I had to take the time to learn about the local culture. I couldn't just assume that people would accept me just because I was Native American. I had to make sure that the care that I provided was relevant locally. Um, I have to tell this funny story. So I was there for about six months. So I was very proud to be American Indian working in a tribal community. Um, all of a sudden, um, I heard people, when I walked through the hallway, you know, the hallways are always crowded in an IHS facility. And um, so I walked down the hallway, people would say, oh, would say something when I walked by. And I was recognizing it was kind of the same thing and I wasn't sure what it was. So I had a friend in medical records. And I said, what do they say? Well, like, I hear them calling me something, but I don't know what it is. And she's like, oh, that's your nickname. I'm like, you know, you know, we always have nicknames in tribal communities. I'm like, what's that? And they're like, oh, you're Cholomene. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I'm like, what's that? And it's like, well, you're the Asian doctor. I'm like, no, I'm Native American. It's like, oh, for six months, they thought I was of a different race. And I'm like, how did that happen? So then I actually had to write a article for the local newspaper to introduce myself and my background and to help people know that I actually was American Indian and Rosebud Sioux and all that. So you can't make assumptions in the communities that people know what you're talking about or know you or whatever. So taking the time to get to know the community, understanding the culture and all of that's really, really important. Thank you. And here we have a question from someone who's getting their doctorate in social work. And they're questioning about uh, the importance of filling the behavioral mental health workforce gap through social work. And this individual is wondering, since most of um, these efforts focus on the medical professions, are you aware of federal or academic initiatives focusing on improving tribal IHS, urban Indian health organization, behavioral mental health workforce capacity? Yeah, absolutely important, critical to have all kinds of healthcare providers and all kinds of um, professionals that can help with the health and wellness of um, tribal communities. I do know that the Indian Health Service Scholarship Program has, it's not just for doctors, it's for a wide variety of specialties. So I would look into that, the loan repayment program may be similar. And then um, I do know that there are a lot of um, Indians into medicine programs around the country that um, you know, think of health professions holistically for Native communities. And so if you know of those, 
it's important. But I know a lot of social workers who have really important positions in, in um, Indian healthcare and in Native um, professions uh, and really make a huge difference. So um, I, I make sure I tell people a lot of times students think being a doctor is the only option. And, you know, it's, it would be horrible if you went through four years of college, four years of medicine, and three to seven years of residency and realized it wasn't for you. That is like, you know, it's a lot of time wasted. So if you have any inkling that you would rather be a different profession, I'd say go for it because every profession is needed to help improve the health of our communities. So thank you for that. And here's a question from someone who's working on building an indigenous health coalition in upstate New York, where they say that the communities are smaller, spread out, and, you know, in comparison to reservations out west, they're wondering if you have any suggestions on how they might begin to assess health disparities in a region with this kind of data challenge where it's communities that are small and much more scattered. That is a big problem. I think the people know about the problem we have generally with small sample sizes and small amounts of data and um, you know can you make conclusions from the data that you have especially if you know you have chronic diseases and uh, lots of different conditions and you only have um, you know some data on that in a small group um, that's something i would talk with the epidemiology center um, for the um, um, Nashville area. Um, I don't, I can't think of the contact on the um, top of my head, but their epidemiology experts can help. Um, and that's what they're, they're supposed to do. Their, their epidemiologists can help and think through ways that you can measure that data and interpret it and um, uh, make sure that it has meaningful data for tribal nations, big or small. And on that note, someone also asked a follow-up about the tribal epidemiologist, epidemiology centers in terms of maternity mortality um, and wondering, you know, how would they connect to try address native health disparities in maternal health care and outcomes? Absolutely. There, um, I think the first thing is if you want to um, contact a tribal epidemiology center, just Google them, just look them up. There's a website that has all of their contact information. Someone in the chat, thank you, Christy Duke is at um, the Nashville um, IHS or the Nashville Tribal Epidemiology Center. There is a website for the tribal epidemiology centers. If you Google it, it'll come right up. You can see all the contacts at the different places. Um, I also would consider I would encourage you to Google or go to PubMed and Google American Indians and maternal child health. And you're gonna find a lot of researchers who actually work in this area. Um, don't be shy, Just, you know, their emails are on the publication, just email them. Like, I know some people are like, oh, I don't wanna to talk to them or they're too big for me. And I get that all the time. Oh, I can't talk to Dr. Rubido, she's so big. You know, it's like, no, we're people and we wanna help. And um, I actually like it when students email me, you know, and want to know who do you know that works on this issue. So, because it's like I can help people. That's my whole thing. I like to help. So, um, yeah, just be brave and find that email address or find someone who might know and write the email. Doesn't hurt. Might help. Great advice. And and here's a, a question from someone who may be a student. You know, can often feel isolating to be the only one leaving our communities to be at universities or at first jobs can be isolating in that way. What suggestions do you have for students or trainees who are the only Indian American Indians, Alaska Natives at their schools or workplaces? Yeah, I experience that a lot. Um, so it's it's something to be very proud of, hmm. but it also has its challenges. Um, it can be very lonely to be the only one at your university who has your interest or the only American Indian or Alaska native in your place. And so the, the key thing is just remember you're, you're proud to be a part of your tribe. Um, the goals that you have are important and critical. And just like I said, when that faculty guy was like, why are you wasting this education on what you want to do? It's like, no, I know that's what I want to do. So you can say that and believe it, but it's not going to impact me. It's kind of like you have to develop that um, sense of self and sense of belief in your goals. Um, and then if, if you are isolated, um, I wouldn't worry about, um, I, I would get involved in um, 
some of these organizations like the Native Research Network or go to conferences if you can and get to know other Native students in other universities that have your same skills. The Association of American Indian Physicians has conferences and student sessions that you can go to and meet people from across the country. I mean, um, you know, I've often been the only one and it can be isolating, but um, you just have to say, you know, I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to get the most I can out of this education. I'm going to move one foot forward and I'm just going to keep going because my community is depending on me. You, if you remember that, then all the little, you know, the little slights of the day or the things people say or, yeah, yeah, all kinds of things said about me, but it's like, well, if that's your opinion, good for you, but I'm still moving forward. You mentioned the Association of American Indian Physicians and you're a past president. How many American Indian Alaska Native physicians are there in the United States and what does the AAIP do? That's a great question. Um, so I don't think I know the exact numbers right now. I know that there are hundreds of members of the Association of American Indian Physicians, but there may be a couple thousand of people who identify as American Indian and Alaska Native. The numbers have gone up over time, but it looks like they're kind of stagnating. From what I know, I could be wrong. The AAMC has data and then the Association of American Indian Physicians has data. Dr. Mary Owen is the current president. And I'm sure she could roll the data off the tip of her tongue. tongue. Um, but it started with, I think, you know, I'm going to say 13 physicians in the early 1970s who realized they needed a network to support each other because um, it's challenging to be the only one. Um, so the organization has grown a lot. And um, I go every year, I maybe have missed one or two meetings. It's just I love seeing all my fellow American Indian physicians. I love mentoring students. It just, it gives me that energy to remember, oh, yeah, this is an important journey we're all on. And we all have to support each other. And um, those kinds of um, organizations can really help you even, especially if you're isolated and you're the only one. I mean, there were only, when I went to Harvard Medical School, there were only two of us who were American Indian Alaska Native. The other thing I would do is don't just think your only help is within the American Indian Alaska Native world. Harvard Medical School, my biggest resource was the other minority organizations and my friends in those. And we would study together, and we would do fun things together. And it's, it's like people from common backgrounds getting together and helping each other. It's really important to do. Um, Cause I, even though everybody else is an American Indian I'm certain there's other first generation students. There's other people with backgrounds similar to yours who face similar challenges. So go find them and hang out with them. Don't, you know, at Harvard, I didn't hang out with the rich kids because I had nothing in common with them, but I hung out with the people who, you know, came from similar backgrounds and who, uh, you know, we supported each other. Wonderful. And uh, someone helpfully put in the chat that the AAIP membership is around 450. So um, that's quite amazing. Um, you know, just to refer back to research here, you've talked about the importance and demonstrated through the, you know, um, diabetes project, the importance of data informing policy in a way that can really change health disparities on the ground. Um, and yet research is often kind of a dirty word in Indian country as all of us who work in there know and navigate. And um, probably the work that you're doing in the PRC with the curriculum you referenced um, is trying to help figure uh, out and set forth for researchers how to engage in partnerships and so on. What do you think are some of the most important steps that researchers should take um, armed with proper orientation and knowledge to better partner with uh, tribal communities for purposes of generating data? Yeah, absolutely. Research is just another tool that can help improve the health of our communities. But there have been a lot of, you know, unfortunate incidents in the past where researchers have, you know, maybe purposely or not taken advantage of tribal communities and they've grown their careers and tribal nations have not seen the benefit. I think of the Havasupai incident where the researcher came in and did the research. She told the tribe she was doing and then she gave the data to a bunch of other people and they did research that the tribe did not want to do. And millions of dollars in lawsuit settlement later that's been hopefully taken care of. But it's, a, it's an example we all have to remember tribes are sovereign nations they have the right to control anything related to their citizens, their land and their resources. So if you're gonna do research with tribal nations, you have to respect their sovereignty, including their 
making sure the research benefits them, making sure that's done respectfully, making sure that the tribe's rights into intellectual property, the data ownership are respected. It's actually pretty complicated. Tribes also have research oversight mechanisms and none of them are the same. So you're really, if you know one tribe, you know one tribe, as they say, you just really have to get to know the tribes really well. And so the training that we do Knowing that research could, if done right, could really help our communities is a training about partnerships, tribal and academic partnerships that often go wrong. And based on some research that we did previously at NCAI uh, that found that governance, trust, and culture are concepts that can really help improve partnership outcomes. So if you can increase the trust, you can understand the tribal sovereignty issues and address those. And if you can uh, understand not the culture of the tribe, but also the culture of academics and find a way to work well together, hopefully that will give better opportunities for the research to actually benefit the tribe and result in really good outcomes. You know, you asked us on the jam board to post, you know, ways in which data might be able to inform policy and in, for Indian country in uh, important ways. Um, and you also talked about, of course, how the uh, PRC sponsors the Tribal Leader Scholars Forum at some of the annual meetings with tribal leaders. What do tribal leaders typically say to you in that context about the most pressing data needs they have? Well, I could go on for days. Um, there are so many needs. I think um, to simplify it as much as I can so I don't go on for days, um, tribal need Tribal nations are governments and they need data to make good decisions. And so what is the data that they need? They need all kinds of data. Um, I think that um, certain priorities these days are of course health, um, funding data, um, client, uh, environmental sustainability, um, climate change. Um, we're trying to call it environmental sustainability because it's, it's, it's really about that for tribal nations. Um, you know, anything related to um, econ the economy of tribes, the um, workforce of tribes, um, infrastructure, um, you know, mental health. I was just on our NIH TAC call and um, mental health is a huge issue in tribal communities and trying to find solutions to help get people the support that they need um, and to try to do that in a culturally, um, responsive way, um, respecting local customs and traditions and the needs of the community, which can be made up of diverse diversity of thought and belief is a challenging thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I could go on on uh, any topic that you think about is important because of the significant disparities, the significant challenges our communities are facing. There's also there needs to be more research. We had a conversation about this yesterday of, and um, uh, uh, the tribal leader um, from Pasquayaki, um, uh, Councilwoman Frias, gave this amazing um, comment about how um, we talk about tribal communities being resilient. I'm not gonna say it as well as she did, so go watch the webcast of the Tribal Advisory Committee for NIH, but um, it was basically saying, we talk about resilience in our communities. What does that really mean? And rather than talking about it as a buzzword and something that, you know, oh, well, you just should be resilient. We really need actual practical ways to help our communities deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And so while resilience is important, it's a positive thing to talk about, what do we really mean by that? And what can people actually do about it to, to endure the, the challenges they're facing and be as healthy and well as they can? So um, I probably didn't say it as well as she did as a tribal leader. I love listening to tribal leaders because they always have a really impressive and really creative and unique perspective because they live these things every single day. So if you have a chance to watch the NIH Tribal Advisory Committee day one um, section on mental health research, um, Councilwoman Frias just did an amazing job. 
Well, we need to wind down here, but I think maybe a, just a final comment, maybe that expands a bit on what you just said. I don't think people realize that there is a tribal advisory committee for the National Institutes of Health, uh, as there is throughout the federal government because of the government to government relationship that sovereign tribal nations have here in the United States. Um, can you say a little more about that advisory committee and what all it does relative to NIH, how it's shaping NIH through its deliberations? Yes, um, so, you know, a big, um, a big development in the Obama administration was the increased, you know, requirements for tribal consultation for federal agencies. And the Biden administration now is enhancing that. Um, but back then the big development was the development of the secretary's tribal advisory committee that secretary Sebelius um, established for the Department of Health and Human Services. And then the Department of Health and Human Services required all the agencies within the department to develop their own tribal consultation policies. And while the National Institutes of Health is still working on their tribal consultation policy a few years ago, they, or several years ago, they did develop their own tribal advisory committee. It's made up of delegates and representatives from tribal nations. It's meant to be government to government consultation. And it's done an amazing job of, um, you know, giving a forum for tribal leaders to say, this is the research that we want you to fund and support for the National Institute of Health. If you go, and they ended up establishing a tribal health research office, Dr. David Wilson is the director of that. And if you go to that website, you can see all of the strategic plan and all of the consultations and all of the work that's being done there to make sure that research is done that uh, addresses the tribal priorities and it's done in a respectful manner. There's a lot of work to do to keep moving that ball forward, but um, we're really grateful for the progress so far. Well, Dr. Rubido, we can't thank you enough for giving us your time and your talent and your insights today about these important issues. And I urge everyone in the chat, if you'd like to offer your gratitude to Dr. Rubido. She also posted that uh, link for an evaluation. I know that's feedback's important to her. So please, uh, if you get a chance to fill out that evaluation form. Um, these seminars are, uh, you know, these indigenous health uh, and well-being colloquiums are jointly uh, a product of the sponsorship from the Department of Health, Global Health and Social Medicine at HMS and the Harvard University. Native American program. So we have a seminar every week uh, in the department. However, our next Indigenous Health Seminar will be on December 1st, and that will feature uh, Professor Melissa Walls from Hopkins, who will be talking to us about Indigenous mental health and well being over the early life course. Professor Walls has done this amazing longitudinal work with Indian youth in the mid Great, Great Lakes region of the country. Um, it's the only research of its kind that does this amazing longitudinal follow up for decades of uh, young people developing in our communities. So I urge you to join us for that as well. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Rubidu, so much. Look forward to seeing you around. Congrats again on election to the National Academy of Medicine. And uh, we look forward uh, to uh, circulating this recording even broader than the number of folks we're able to attend today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And congratulations to you as well and the National Academy of Medicine membership. It's good to see them finally admitting more American Indians and Alaska Natives doing research. And thank you all for attending. So long, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>